This is Hannibal from the HannibalTV.com and I'm about to do a shoot interview with the man that painted all of these beautiful paintings here at the house of Captain Rich Bauer, formerly of the Phoenix Fire Department. He makes rich women beg, good women steal, old women blush, and young women squeal. Superstar Billy Graham, the man who is bad to the bone. This is Hannibal from TheHannibalTV.com and I'm with former world champion and WWE Hall of Famer, superstar Billy Graham, the women's pet, the men's regret. What you see is what you get and what you don't see is better yet. How are you doing today, sir? You're doing it. You got a great. You're doing better than me. Hannibal. <laughs> I don't think anyone can do it better than you. The only person that can do you better than you is some of the things, not better than you, but maybe he was pushed a little more, was Hulk Hogan. When he took your, uh, your gimmick and Vince McMahon Jr., it wasn't Vince McMahon Sr. anymore who held you back, and then he got the big push and got over with your gimmick. Yeah, and he uh, also went to 24 wins by Toss instead of 22. <laughs> yeah. So. And apparently he's also afraid of me now, so uh, that's all right. Doesn't matter too much. No. To start this off though, I'll just bring that up right away. Uh, there's a popular video on YouTube on this channel of when you reunited with Hulk Hogan about six years ago. Uh, it's on the Hannibal TV. I was there at uh, WrestleCon. Has he ever had any contact with you since that day or was that pretty much it? Not a word. No, uh, there was uh, really, uh, uh, we, we, we buried the hatchet at that WrestleCon that uh, you, were, you were at and uh, uh, had your encounter with uh, Hulk and uh, uh, so uh, nevertheless, uh, he's never contacted me and I really never reached out and contacted him. So. Did you happen to see his port pornographic video? Oh, no, I had no desire. <laughs> no, no, not at all. What do you think about all that controversy that he was involved with? They took him out of the Hall of Fame and they put him back in and now I guess he's back appearing on their TV like nothing happened. Uh, yeah, it was very bizarre. Uh, uh, he was using the N-word uh, like in every other sentence and uh, his uh, out was that he thought it was cool to with the people he was talking with he used the n-word uh, more or less so the black african-american uh, folks would recognize him because they call each other the n-word and they have every right to but uh, that was a very bizarre uh, thing and um, uh, pulling him out uh, you know I guess they had to they had to do something to make it uh, make it popular and um, and they did uh, but they reinstated him so uh, it means nothing really. So WWE has his network now and people that are subscribers to the network get all the pay per views. Do you think if they still made money? by individual buys of pay-per-views that they would have had that uh, women's match as the WrestleMania main event this past year, or this year, 2019? If they would have had what? Like, if, if they still had pay-per-views where people had to buy the pay-per-view to get WrestleMania, whereas now they subscribe to the network, and when you're a subscriber to the network, you get all the pay-per-views. So it's not like the old days where you'd call uh, your cable company in order the pay-per-view is an individual pay-per-view exactly um i don't i don't believe that it would have been like the old old school era of pay-per-views uh that did tremendous business uh because ronda rousey was not really over she was pushed more than any other human being female or male in the history of the WWE by Vince, by Triple H, by Stephanie, 
while the entire company push, push. She had the biggest push of anyone in the history of that company and still was not over. You cannot convince me that she would have sold one ticket. Yes, the, it was the first women's main event at WrestleMania, April the 7th, this Sunday, uh, today is Friday the 26th, April 26th, three weeks ago. Uh, they were the main event. But it was a horrible match. I saw highlights of it. And uh, it, it, it was, but it was a perfect opportunity for Vince to use those three girls, Charlotte, Becky Lynch, and Ronda Rousey, because of Rousey's UFC pass. Even though she got her ass kicked in her last two fights, knocked out cold by Holly Holmes in Australia, with a vicious side kick to the head, and then it only lasted 48 seconds with Amanda Nunes from Brazil, which I watched that fight. 48 seconds, and the referee stopped it before Amanda Nunes completely took her head off because she was already out on her feet. And he, I think he stopped her early. 48 seconds. So her last two appearances in the UFC were by knockout. She lost. So you cannot tell me she's the greatest UFC female fighter ever. When you lose your last two by such horrific short time knockouts, and then you cry in the ring like a child, and then you tell, and then you tell people, she sat there and wept like a baby in the ring, and then she, she said she's gonna commit suicide over the loss. This woman is such a mental case that I don't know how she made it through an entire 12 months, one year, from, one, from the first mania to this last mania, because she's an absolute, in my personal opinion, and a lot of other people, a total basket case. And I've never been impressed by her because she would hurt women in other matches, this is documented, videotape, still posed, with that vicious arm bar of hers. And then after she, they would tap out her opponent, she'd stand over him and laugh and make these weird faces like a lunatic and, and belittle her opponent who's writhing in pain from that hold and tapped out and she would laugh at him. So to me, she's disgusting. As, as, a, as a fighter, I've, I've seen too much of her. And I thank God that she is on an extended stay to get pregnant and have a child and ra raise a family. Let her go. And speaking of wrestlers who uh, got knocked out in UFC, Brock Lesnar actually got knocked out in two of his last three fights in the first round. His last fight was actually ultimately ruled a draw because he failed the, uh, the drug test. Drug so test. what's your opinion on Brock Lesnar? Obviously, he's the, a, a big draw for WWE. I'm not denying that. Um, he's making huge money. I'm just curious your opinion. Uh, he has a big body similar to, to your physique, and he's a monster. Oh, um, yeah, you know, I think he's a tremendous athlete. There's no question of his athletic ability, but he is the most fortunate man to work, to ever wrestle for the WWF, three WFs, two WFs, and the WWE ever because he has Paul Heyman to do his promos for him. I have seen interviews of Lesnar just standing there and not say a word because my close friend, my good buddy Paul Heyman, one of the best mouthpieces ever in pro wrestling would cut the promo for Lesnar. So Lesnar, being a great athlete, a great athlete, no, no doubt about it, uh, didn't have to worry about cutting a promo, which if you're on your own and can't cut a promo, 
Look at these guys. They get, get these scripts handed to them. Can't cut a promo. Bobby Lashley. Lashley. Who I like, by the way, but that's the truth. Yeah. And what would you say your favorite match of all time was, as well as your least favorite match of all time? Oh, there's no question. Um, also, my favorite opponent would be Dusty Rhodes. And my favorite match would have been the uh, two matches, uh, the Texas Death Match in Madison Square Garden, where I went underneath the ring and pulled out a rope and threw it in because uh, there was no disqualification, and uh, threw this long rope in the ring. There's many, many pictures of that. You've seen them. And it wrapped it around Dusty and choked him. And then he threw me outside and then wrapped the rope around me and choked me. And then I put my arms out purposely to make it look like a crucifixion scene in that famous photo of me and my feet were off the floor with that rope around my neck. And he's pulling me, leaning over the top rope. And I, I'm stressed and my feet leave the, and I almost passed out, so I had to grab the rope and pull myself up to the apron. But those two matches, the Texas Death Match and the Bull Rope Match, inside Madison Square Garden, forever would never, the pandemonium could not be matched. Dusty Rhodes has so much charisma, and <laughs> see, he just like so much magnetism, and those two matches, uh, were, were my favorite matches of all time. And of course, Dusty was just loved New York, loved Madison Square Garden, loved coming up to Boston, uh, Philadelphia, New York, Madison Square Garden, most of the And your, your least favorite that fans would know about, I mean, I'm sure you've had terrible matches with people that we've never heard of, but is there one of a, a wrestler <laughs> we would know? Probably because I wasn't a very good worker. Oh, you were a great worker. I wasn't that good of a wrestler. Well, you hold uh, the Madison Square Garden, out, Garden sellout record 19 out of 20, so if you're judging it by uh, True. popularity, that's what I judge as a good wrestler. Well, yes, uh, uh, that's the uh, most uh, uh, sellouts uh, percentage, highest percentage highest. of sellouts, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think uh, Bruno has the most, but you have the highest percentage. Yes, exactly right. So, uh, but that was all because of the, the charisma involved and the promos involved, and it was just they, the, the 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 fans had never. I was very fortunate to come in at that time, and uh, of the basically everywhere with black trunks, and uh, there was no color, there was no. Uh, I basically broke the mold, and the fans just. New York. So there was more, uh, there was, de it was definitely not the wrestling matches, the actual physical matches that sold out the building. It was the promos that I made people believe that Bruno or Putsky or Mil Mascaras or whoever I wrestled would indeed suffer pain and bleed, and in those days you could say bleed. And I used a promo one time that aired that I, I had taken Diana Ball and testosterone to get ready for this match, and it aired. And now you... I actually saw that promo, and I think Mike <laughs> uh, shared it on your Facebook. That was hilarious. <laughs> You're all talking about the... Actually, a fan wanted me to ask you this, uh, and I know you don't mind saying it. What was the best uh, steroid cycle you ever did? Oh, I don't know, because I, I never went off. I, I, I never... Especially during my wrestling, that period, because I didn't want to go, on, go off and start losing my physique, so I just kept on taking, 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 abusing, and uh, to stay at my, my best, uh, because I was a champion, and I didn't want to go off. I didn't want to cycle like I should have intelligently done. So, uh, I don't know. And what do you think about uh, Cody Rhodes and the new uh, All Elite Wrestling promotion that everyone's talking about? Well, I, I did read uh, I did read some some comments by the owner Khan, who owns the Jacksonville Jaguars, and um, 
Uh, he, he seems to really believe that they're committed to five years, they're going to have good, uh, a good television, uh, uh, didn't mention the station, uh, and uh, uh, he, he actually said that he's going to take it back to 20 years at least, uh, and I don't know if that's really going to happen. When I read that Cody's going to have transgender wrestlers, uh, as part of the talent pool, but I did notice in a photograph when Cody had that press conference in Jacksonville, and uh, it was at the podium, and the two wrestlers next to him uh, looked awful small. So uh, as a whole, I think his wrestler, wrestler the, the the crew, uh, are are not. I think Chris Jericho might be the biggest guy I know of that they have. Maybe there's more that they that I don't know about, but Chris Jericho might be the most muscular guy I've seen. Who and he is in good shape, but he's not that imposing. Oh no no no! He's not that. Oh my God! He doesn't. You know he doesn't draw you like when you. Yeah, he's a good size, a great worker, uh, but he certainly doesn't have that impact. And I actually, actually on that subject, I think I, I, I read a quote from Quoty because, by the way, for all you fans, I don't watch, I do not sit there and sit through three hours of Raw and sit through all those commercials and watch the repetitive promos and the, uh, I, I, I get my, my information from all of the wrestling slides are mostly Dave Meltzer. Anything Dave Meltzer says is gold. Anything Dave Meltzer says, if he misses it, it'll be right the next day, if he misses something. So that's where I get my information. And here's a question, now this is probably never going to happen, but you did tell me in the past, if WWE ever used me again, you'd walk me to the ring. Um, if I ever wrestled in Madison Square Garden, if I ever wrestled Cody Rhodes in All Elite Wrestling, would you walk me to the oh, ring? Oh, yes. Yes, I would. <laughs> yes, I would. I would walk you to the ring. I would absolutely be honored to. And they should use you. Cody Rhodes, Cody, listen to me. We had a good talk four years ago when you were still with the WWE. I'm talking to you right now, Cody. Right now, I know you're going to hear this. It'll get out there. I think you're doing a great job. It's going to be a fantastic success. But you need to hire Hannibal. You need this man on your roster. Take him from Superstar Billy Graham. I'm endorsing my endorsement. I'm endorsing Hannibal and urging you, Cody, to get a hold of him and talk to the man and sign him to a contract because he is a supreme excellent worker and is a believable promo man and I personally have helped him with his promos and, and, and threw out ideas for him uh, in his promos which was an honor for me to help such a talented man. So I'm going on record right now, Cody Rhodes, you and I talked and you talked about the belt buckle. I gave your dad, and you still have that belt buckle. And Dusty won, that's so bad. I paid a thousand dollars for this beautiful silver belt buckle with the stars on it, had it custom made, and Dusty wanted it, and I took it off and gave it to your father. So on your father, uh, your father, my, my dearest friend, and my favorite opponent, I'm asking you to please seriously consider contacting Hannibal, Devin Nicholson, and signing this man to He will be plus. He will be, he will be faithful and a plus to your organization. And I urge you to contact him and, and negotiate and sign him because he will do nothing but good for your, for your talent pool and, and, and your, your, the quality of people that you want. 
So that's coming by from superstar Billy Graham to you, Cody. Sign Hannibal. Well, thank you very much. And that was a free. <laughs> I didn't get paid to say that. That was free. <laughs> Sign I really, Hannibal. I really appreciate that. And one guy that you endorsed on screen uh, that we never talked about in any of our other interviews was Don Morocco. Uh, do you have any uh, memories of him and what exactly happened there? Uh, you were, he was getting the push with you as a manager. Then something happened where I heard there was an incident with him and an agent and he was released or something. So he had with Don Morocco, am I? No, with an agent, like why he got released by WWE because you guys were getting the push there um, with you managing Morocco. Like, uh, I don't know what happened with Don Morocco, uh, why? I know I was having health problems. I was having health problems even as a manager traveling because of my hips. I would have to, when I get off of the airplane and, and, and go to the baggage claim, I'd have to stop at a restroom just to sit down and rest my back. Because my back, my spine has collapsed four inches. I've lost four inches of height because of a collapsed spine. So uh, I was having problems traveling and Vince finally just said, well, let's try you at commentating, color commentating, which I really enjoyed. And I really believe that Vince should have gave me a longer shot at it, a longer run, because I, I really felt like I was doing a good job. And just needed more time to get into the room, but it didn't happen. You did commentate. And he said, I'm going to have to put you in the bullpen, Superstar. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he called me. But you called the first SummerSlam, and that obviously is... Yeah, the SummerSlam, first ever SummerSlam, with a Gorilla Monsoon. And that was a joy, that was a pleasure. And I thought I did a good job at it. Any memories, speaking of that, about Bruce Pritchard? He's had a resurgence, he's back on the creative team. I know you worked with him a bit uh, in that last run you had. Yeah, not really. Um, uh, Bruce Pritchard's, uh, hmm. I know... Um, Brother Love. His, his, his brother, uh, uh, Tom Pritchard. Yeah, uh, very, very, we're very, very good friends and uh, uh, traded autograph pictures and everything. But um, uh, I know he has a brilliant mind for the business. But I also know that there's the creative team, the, the creative team for professional wrestling, WWE. I don't know how many people they have, but I do know, like everyone else knows, that Vince just hired Dana Warrior to the creative team, and according to Dave Meltzer, because, Who why is, is this lady on the creative team? She's already been made a goodwill ambassador for the WWE and makes appearances for the WWE as a goodwill Ambassador Dana Warrior. Oh, this is the Ultimate Warrior's ex. The Ultimate Warrior. Okay. Yeah, well, it was a great guy. And I'm really sorry about his passing. This is nothing. I don't know the lady. I'm sure she's a very nice lady. But she has been signed, and Meltzer has just reported this a few weeks ago that she has been elevated to a very high position on the creative team that only Vince Triple H. Stephanie and a few other people sit in on the rest of the creative team or another room and she has been inserted into the upper echelon with Vince himself and her initial quote that she gave to the press about joining and wanting to be on the creative team is because she thought that the WWE could use a woman's perspective on wrestling. Well, isn't uh, Stephanie McMahon already head of creative? I have no idea. <laughs> but that, that yeah. was Dana Warrior's quote, right. that she wanted to give the creative team a woman's perspective about professional wrestling, which is beyond me, Hannibal. It's beyond me how how Vince could say, yes, we need you on our creative team because we need a woman's perspective about professional wrestling. I'm sorry. 
but I'm happy she has a job. I wish he would have thought about me. I've got a little bit of creative ability. <laughs> But, but nevertheless, I, I, I only wish her the best. But I, I found it bizarre. Well, I find Very it bizarre. bizarre just because it's a product that is mostly viewed by males. So to have an older woman writing, yeah. whether it's Stephanie or any other older women, it's just weird. How are they going to know what young males to middle-aged males are going the to The age demographic is what, 18 to 48 or yeah, something like that? something like that. Male? Yeah. Are the, and they're the most, people who, who view it the most? Well, how is a woman's perspective going to help that age group? And speaking of uh, being added to the creative team and just read this the other day, just two days ago, they released their first quarter uh, earnings. earnings and and their stock I have the note right here share was at ninety eight dollars a share and the first quarter dropped to eighty four dollars a share approximately a fifty percent drop and that was that equated to a one billion dollar loss for the company, which is nothing for the company. But they still lost one billion dollars from the first quarter for the first quarter of this year, uh, 2019. And it's very strange. But I heard Ben say this. I saw him, and I heard it with my own ears and so on eyes. He said, I'll never forget it, and it's true. This man said, the WWE will be so much better off once I kick the bucket. Once I die and I'm gone, the WWE will be much better off. Why? Because he micromanages everything he changes he changes finishes 30 minutes before a match uh very the the things i've read his micromanaging and 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 and, and changing a, a promo and changing the a finish of a match uh, he micromanages everything of course it will be better off i don't want this to die i hope he lives to be 90. I'm 75, but I think Vince and I are close to the same age. And so, but it's a very, everything that Vince even knows for a fact that he over micromanages the inner workings of them and it will actually be better off. Now that, that means that Triple H, of course, will inherit where Vince has uh, once been. So I, I hope Vince a long, 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 uh, per, uh, productive life. He's been, always been very healthy, trained, very dedicated to bodybuilding, and uh, I, I wish him nothing but a long, long, uh, healthy, healthy life. And speaking of that, this was a question I had for you. What do you think Vince actually owes his uh, past wrestlers as far as, uh, and his current wrestlers as far as 401ks, health insurance, and so forth? Like, what oh. do you think? Oh, well, health insurance, uh, it's very bizarre, but actually it's been the history of pro wrestling, uh, Hannibal, that I don't think there's ever been any promoter uh, from Vern Gagne, the AWA, to Paul Bosch in Houston, to Roy Shires in San Francisco, to Mike LaBelle in Los Angeles, uh, to Eddie Graham in Florida, all the way up to Vince that has ever given any wrestler health insurance. However, if you're in the office, if you're in the office and, and, and work at a computer and, 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 and you're an executive or, or a secretary or just work in the office, period, you have health insurance. You're covered. But does the wrestler who and, and, and the injuries, the injuries. Daniel Bryan 
We know he was he was out for years because of his, the the WWE medical staff would not clear him. He was cleared by other doctors, but the WWE doctors would not clear him until it got very close to the end of his contract. They finally cleared him in another wrestle. They did a fantastic job uh, wrestling as uh, the WWE champion. You're under a WWE Legends contract now. You've explained to me before your last royalty payment was only $75 or something. But uh, did they ever ask you to come to their NXT uh, Performance Center to teach a promo class? And if they had, would you have? Did they ever ask me what? To come to the NXT Performance Center to teach promo class to the developers. Early on, early on, I had discussed that on the telephone with Triple H. We talked about, and, and I had given us a real deep thought and talked it over with my wife Valerie about going, uh, uh, going to Florida and, 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 and being uh, uh, a part of uh, the developmental center uh, that Triple H so wisely built um, and uh, uh, helping the guys cut promos and but um, uh, uh, and then we talked about it some more and finally we just came to the conclusion uh, that um, my health really was too unpredictable at that time and it would be best if you had really chosen someone else and 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 I'm glad I didn't because I really wouldn't have enjoyed it because I uh, because you no matter what you teach them they're still going to have a script handed to them <laughs> that they have to follow so it, it, it eventually uh, I wouldn't have uh, I wouldn't have enjoyed it but it was we, we did talk about it Triple H and I what was your favorite lift to do in the gym, and what were your uh, top three best lifts when, when you were at your peak? The, my favorite li lift? Like, did you have a favorite exercise to do in the gym, and then also, what were your top three best lifts? Oh, I, I, did, uh, I did a lot of benching, I did a lot of tricep work, a lot of neck work, I thought a big, thick neck was very impressive uh, to have. And uh, I, I did a lot of uh, tricep work. I thought triceps were, were very important, a part uh, of the uh, overall physique and uh, benching. And uh, I did, in fact, uh, uh, bench press, uh, uh, I believe it was 605 at the time before I started wrestling with Arnold uh, Schwarzenegger spotting me in the original Gold Gym back up like 1969. So, Mr. Presley was really my favorite, uh, my favorite lift. And a lot of fans and autograph people have asked why you don't do autograph appearances and that is directly because of your health issues, right? And we're gonna put up a video related to your GoFundMe where you explain that. Yes, exactly. It's impossible for me to travel. Uh, I'm, I'm waiting on my goal for me to, to get up there enough where I can have this uh, uh, hip operation, uh, a revision, very complicated, extremely complicated uh, uh, operation. I've had five hip revisions on my left hip and, and it's been dislocated probably four different times. I've had four, four dislocations where the ball of your femur the head of your femur was up near my ribs. <laughs> and, and that doesn't feel good, Hannibal. <laughs> I can think of the pain, but boy, when you get a hip dislocation, plus what made mine was Red Bastille had a couple of dislocations. But the, and, and, and went in and still had a, uh, a little get together with uh, John Tolos and some other guys back in the day, and his hip was dislocated as soon as he got out of the car. But the reason, the difference between his and my dislocation is I had more muscle mass and, and they couldn't reinsert the hip into the socket because the muscle, my muscle mass grabbed my uh, femur and, and ball of the head of the femur and just, they couldn't put it back in manually. So they had to uh, uh, put me to sleep, knock you out, and literally 
uh, go in and uh, re, uh, reset it. And then I had to wear a cast. Oh my God, what torture. I had to wear an old school cast. Now they have braces. Of course, technology's approved. But I had to wear this cast all the way around me, down to my, uh, my pelvis, uh, so I wouldn't so I wouldn't bend over, because bending, the first, my doctor told me that I would be back, if I, go to, if I go to wrestling, if I wrestle after my first hip operation, he said, you're gonna go, you're telling me, superstar, you're gonna wrestle after I fix your hip, after my first hip operation? He said, well, if you do, you'll be back in my office in three years or less, because you're gonna wear your hip out, and I'm gonna put another hip in you. And he said, so, and sure enough, that's when I went on the road. I made the comeback in 1987 and ruined my hip, went back in, and Dr. Dorr, Los Angeles, world-renowned uh, hip replacement specialist, uh, put my hip back together again. And he said, by the way, if you go back to wrestling, I'll never work on your hip again. I said, I'm retiring, doctor, don't, don't, don't worry about it. And he, and, and so as he, on that second hip surgery, my first five minutes home from the hospital, Hannibal, I sat down in the chair. There's no way I'm sitting on this couch. My wife, Valerie, went to the store to get some food. I was released from the hospital in Los Angeles. The telephone rings and it's on the floor. And instinctively I bend over to pick up the telephone and I bend too far and my hip comes out of joint. The first five minutes home after my second hip put in. Five minutes and the hip, it came out, oh my God. So I hobbled out of the car, laid down in the back seat. My wife took me back to the hospital and I reset my hip. And that started the whole sequence of problems with my left hip. That's why it's so now, bad to this day. You haven't done any videos since Bruno San Martino passed away. Uh, what are your thoughts on his passing and uh -huh. Bruno San Martino oh. dying? And what was your favorite memory of him from outside of Oh, him? Bruno, yeah, it's, it's a tragedy, but I, I, I don't know. Did he make it into his early 80s? I think he was 82. -ish. 82, something like that. He, he had a great life. He was a great man. Uh, he, he, there was never a rumor about him. There was never anything salacious about him. Uh, uh, he was always uh, uh, a gentleman to me, and the fans worshipped him because in that era, uh, it was all about ethnic Italians, and Pedro Morales was champion uh, Puerto Ricans. So, uh, uh, it, it was really a great honor uh, to, to, to wrestle Bruno, but he was tired. This senior told me that. He said, Bruno is tired. And the mats we had back in that era, Hannibal, were most of them were boxing rings, which, which are hard. He didn't have the, the give like a uh, yeah, square guard. I've wrestled in some boxing rings. You wrestled in some boxing they They're hard. They, there's very little give. And it just, so many years of Bruno working all those towns and, uh, and on boxing rings and bad, uh, bad uh, rings like that, totally um, uh, warm out. And he, it was just time for him to retire. And, uh, uh, and, uh, I, I was honored uh, to be uh, chosen to, uh, to have Bruno pass the torch uh, to me and think nothing but great fond memories of the man and willing to sell, willing to lay down and let you beat the crap out of them and sell and sell and, and, and put you over. No ego with Bruno San Martino. And that was, uh, and of course, I did the same for him. Obviously, I enjoyed selling, as a matter of fact. That's probably my best part of my wrestling skill was selling. So, but Bruno was in the exact same way, so I, I have nothing but praise and good, good fond memories of Bruno San Martino. And do you have any memories of Ivan Putski? 
Oh, yes, Ivan Pusky. Oh, my gosh, he was so over. I had worked with Ivan Pusky at the AWA for Vern Gagne uh, uh, in, in many, many towns and uh, Polish power uh, and Chicago and uh, different places. He was so over. Then in, in New York, uh, 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 he was so over. Uh, nothing but fond memories uh, uh, of Ivan and um, uh, he he, uh, uh, he he was a little bit difficult to work with because he was shorter and blocky, so it was a different a different a little bit of a different uh, situation. But we we still had just power matches and we we just basically bear hugs, full Nelsons, and very very simple matches. But he would sell out Polish power. He would sell out. He was over, and uh, one of my one of my fondest uh, uh, fondest memories is, is his friendship uh, in the locker room and on the road. And um, before we get into your your notes, there any memories of wrestling in Allentown? They used to do all the TV tapings there. Oh, Allentown! Yeah, uh, I mean, very simple stuff. Uh, uh, TV, uh, TV taping, uh, and uh, back then, uh, one thing compared to current times is that the champion uh, uh, didn't have to wrestle every week on television. Now, the champion, uh, it may not be a championship match, but the champion is on uh, the, the, the Raw or SmackDown, uh, whatever, Universal Champion or United States Champion or the Intercontinental Champion or whatever, WWE Champion, they're wrestling every week on television. And that, is, that was so unnecessary, uh, it is so unnecessary to see the champion. You don't have to wrestle, uh, but you, cut, you will cut your promos. So that was one of the great things about my era, which already is two generations removed. And so uh, you didn't have to wrestle every week on TV, but you would pre-cut your promos. And so it was not necessary to get in the ring. But when you did, it, in my case, it would be a squash job. And you had great guys willing to, uh, to do a five minute squash job. And of course, I had the advantage of the Grand Wizard uh, being my manager and having all the outlandish, outlandish things that he would do, and take it off my shirt, my sunglasses, comb my hair, and, and it, it was it was a good match. At first, I didn't like it when this man told me he was going to put me with the Grand Wizard. When I when I came in, I said I said wait a minute, Vince, this is Vince Senior. I said Vince, I don't need a manager to. Uh, to get over or to, or, to, or to help me with promos. And he says, oh, he says, Billy. I'll never forget this, this senior sitting in that old uh, Philadelphia arena on a bench. He says, Billy, uh, Ernie, Ernie Roth, Grand Wizard, he is the best mouthpiece of the business. And, and I said, oh, I know. I said, I, said, I just don't. I just don't need anyone to help me with my promos. I'm very confident in my promos. And so we discussed it, and he said, Billy, this is a great line. He said, Billy, just do it for me. <laughs> I, said, I just met you. <laughs> Fizz and I laughed, and Fizz had a smile, had a great smile, this senior, and he laughed. And I said, I just met you. Why don't we just do it for you? And so, of course, I said, yes, uh, let's do it. And I said, I'll make it work for the Grand Wizard. I'll use the Grand Wizard, and we'll work out a thing together, and we'll make it work. So, but the line, Billy, just do it for me, <laughs> I, I found it very, uh, like, I just met you, Vince. What do you mean, just do it for you? So I thought that was kind of funny. And we're going to get into these notes you have on the situation with Kofi Kingston and Booker T, but all the fans wanted to know, uh, 
For a while, there was some heat between you and Chris Jericho. Just quickly, that's all over with now, right? Uh, Did I what? You, you don't hold any heat towards Chris Jericho anymore, do you? Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, Chris Jericho, uh, uh, I'll never forget when I was inducted into the uh, Hall of Fame. In the back, uh, as we were lined up ready to go out, Chris Jericho, I don't know how it started. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, I don't even know what the word is, uh, disagreements that we supposedly had, how that uh, I think it was, you know how? It was something he wrote in his book that uh, maybe oh. wasn't entirely true and you, you took offense to it, but you were going through some rough times at that time as well. And uh, Oh, I see, okay, for, that's right, so it was something he it. wrote in his book, okay. Yeah. And um, so anyway, backstage at the Hall of Fame, when uh, I was being inducted by Triple H. Thank you, Triple H. It was a great induction, by the way. It was an honor for, to have you, to have you induct me into the uh, WWF Hall of Fame. So anyway, uh, Chris Jericho came over to me uh, backstage and I was sitting down while we were waiting to go out on the platform and said, hey, superstar, he says, I, I just want to apologize for anything that I may have said or, uh, you know, I said, hey, brother, don't worry about it, man. I said, I say things that I should have never said so many times. I said, I said, man, let, let's just bury that hatchet right now, right now. I got a shirt at him, gave him a big hug, and I think he's a great guy. You're a great guy, Chris Derrick. Hope you hear this. <laughs> and uh, you have something you want to clear up. Uh, Booker T's made some comments, and I guess, uh, regarding some comments you made about Kofi Kingston. And you got some notes here that you wanted to uh, go well, over. The thing is, the Booker T. Uh, excuse me, take a drink. Of. What happened was, I made a, a comment on my Facebook about Kobe Kingston being way too small uh, to really adequately represent a WWE champion. And I, and I uh, suggested, and I actually urged Kobe to use some steroids. And so that statement created complete hysteria in the wrestling universe. All those sites picked it up, you heard about it in Canada, everywhere. And oh my God, superstar Billy Graham is telling Kobe Kingston to use steroids. Oh my God, like it was the sin of all sins. And so, so Booker, Booker T, Booker T, I love you, brother. I love you. When I when I was when I was backstage, you came over to me, man. We hugged each other, and and you watched me wrestle in Houston when he was in Houston, Texas. Uh, he watched me wrestle, and and our I got pictures of our first meeting at the Hall of Fame. So 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 anyway, he gave me a big hug, and we sat down and talked. Me and Booker, when I, when I was, that time I was in, in Phoenix, when Triple H called me and asked me to go down and do some interviews uh, for their uh, files about how it was years ago. And so, uh, anyway, uh, I, made it, I made that mention that uh, it, it, I would urge Kofi uh, to use some steroids to put on some bulk, to add some size uh, to, to him, I, I just thought he would look look better because maybe I'm prejudiced of being uh, because I was a bodybuilder all my life, and I, I like to, and I came from a big man era, and so I mean you don't get much bigger than the Ultimate Warrior or Sid Vicious, you know Kevin Nash, <laughs> some pretty big guys. So oh, I yeah. so oh, that yeah. anyway created complete hysteria. And so Booker was on the 
Booker was on the podcast. I forgot who the guy was. I got into the podcast, and then Booker says, Booker T has a stack of papers in, 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 in front of him. And he says, I gotta get into the superstar telling Kobe Kingston to take steroids. He says, he's a superstar. He said, man, he said, we lost too many people to drugs. This is Booker T speaking now. He starts off with that, with that. He says, superstar, we lost way too many boys to drugs. Yes, we lost Kurt Henning to an overdose, sadly. I love Kurt Henning, like a kid. I love this guy. Valerie, my way, he, he rode with me and Valerie from New York to Boston, and when he got in the car and I introduced him to Valerie, he said, that's your wife? She I said, yeah, she's too pretty to be your wife. So get out of my car, Kurt Henning. So anyway, that was one of the, the folks who had an accidental overdose. Yeah. And so he threw out this subject that we lost too many guys to drugs. So he lumped, first of all, he made a mistake there, Booker. You're lumping my suggestion to Kopi to use steroids with recreational drugs. So that was the first mistake you made by saying, oh, we lost too many boys. Too many guys are gone because of drugs. Well, then he went into this stack of papers, Booker, and he said, look at this, look at this. Admitted to the hospital for internal bleeding. Admitted to the hospital for a blockage of some kind. A liver transplant. Da -da 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 -da. On and on and on. And, and scolding me and reprimanding me about suggesting and urging Kofi to use steroids to enhance his look. Because I thought it was, it, it's important to have a better look. Kofi Kingston looks like he weighs about 150, 60, 70 pounds. And I just, so I just threw that out there, but, 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 but Booker, Booker threw the book at me. Booker, that's a good line. Booker T threw the book at me and went through a whole list of illnesses that I've had and, and uh, you don't know what I've had really and why I've had these illnesses because you have not seen the records from the Mayo Clinic Hospital where I've had all these issues. The doctors in the Mayo Clinic Hospital will not release my official medical records to you Booker T. I still love you, man. I love you. I, I love Booker T. He was a legit dude, the real guy, a great champion. And he was big, man. At one point, started to cramp a little bit. At one point, Booker T was huge. I'm not saying Booker took steroids. He, he probably did. You can't get that big without taking steroids. There's nothing wrong with that, Booker. I'm just saying you made a mistake. I did not tell or urge Kofi Kingston to abuse steroids like I did and cause tremendous hip damage. And by the way, Booker, as I said on my Facebook post, I did not have a liver transplant because of steroids. I had a liver transplant because of that contracted hepatitis C by cutting my head open with a razor blade in the 70s. And we bled on each other, and we had co-mingling blood baths. And so whatever disease my opponent had, I would get, and vice versa. Because of the blade job, blade job, blade job, razor blade, and I contracted hepatitis C, Booker T, and that's what took out my liver. Not steroids but doing blade jobs and contracting hepatitis C, which, by the way, I have been cured of, 
thank God to the technology just as Hannibal sitting here asking me these questions and doing this interview has been cured of hepatitis C going on I believe five years now and he went through hell for seven or eight months of interferon and 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 really toxic poisons. Some people refuse to take that type of treatment and just would rather die because the treatment is worse than having hepatitis C. But he endured it and he got clean. And so he's been clean of hepatitis C and you do it, you give a blood test and so and, and they check your blood, there's no trace. He's been clean for five years. He has no hepatitis C virus in his bloodstream, period. Cody Rhodes, he's clean. Just like me, the Mayo Clinic came up, said, oh my God, we see in our records that you have never been treated for hepatitis C. We've given you a liver transplant, which saved my life. I was 30 days away from dying. And when I got my liver transplant, and thank God for Kate Gilroy, 23-year-old young girl here in Phoenix that had a car crash. It was a donor, and I got her liver. Uh, so you got to understand, Booker T, you just can't be putting the papers around and uh, calling out know, illnesses that I've had uh, because people get the wrong idea. And so uh, I don't want an apology. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not that. I don't need an apology, Booker. Just, just, just don't be talking about my health issues when you do not have access to my health records. I do not know what you've been through health-wise because I don't have your health records. And I wouldn't talk about it anyway. But just don't. You made a mistake, Booker. You talked like you hated me, as a matter of fact. Okay? Booker T, I'm talking to you, brother. You talked on that podcast like you hated my guts. All right? For suggesting to Kofi Kingston, who weighs about 160 pounds, who's probably the nicest guy in the world, by urging him to do a cycle of steroids to put on some lean muscle mass. You buried me, brother. And I do not appreciate it. However, I do not also hold a grudge. I went back and made a Facebook posting and I said, I didn't tell Kofi Kingston or urge him to abuse steroids. I simply mentioned Captain Rich for Kofi Kingston to use steroids for a few cycles, six weeks, go off of to add some muscle mass. So that's what I wanted to make clear, and thank you for the opportunity. And Booker, I still love you, brother. It's and a done you, deal. You've been generous with your time here. You've given us a good hour. So uh, we hope that we're going to catch up with you another time and do another interview with you. But you, you talked about hepatitis C so much. There's one guy that passed away, I understand, from hepatitis C-related comp complications who you used to work with, uh, Ivan Koloff. Uh, yeah, very anyway. unfortunate. I've been waiting too long to uh, to get treatment, and uh, sadly, uh, he uh, uh, succumbed to. Uh, he couldn't afford liver treatment, failure. I think, because he he had to go fund me shortly before he died. But yeah, he never could afford. The but it was too late. Yeah. He went too late. It was too far progressed. But I'd like to. I'd like to. Just, I'd like to read a quote from Kofi Kofi Kingston. And, and th th this shows, Kobe's been in the business I've read 13, 14 years, maybe. 11, 12, 13 years? Since at least 2006. Okay. Do the math. After winning the belt from Daniel Bryan, he did an interview with TMZ. And this is the mindset of Kobe Kingston. This is, this is one quote, I'm going to read the exact quote. Because I suggested in my Facebook posting that the Big E and Xavier Woods 
the new day, his partners turn on him and 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 uh, go heel, and you would have a tremendous run against the Big E and against Xavier Woods uh, and also Daniel Bryan. But one of the first interviews Kofi Kingston gave, I, I, I wrote, I saw it, I wrote it down word for word, and we'll wrap it up with this. And this is no knock on Kofi, this is just where his head is at. He's talking to TMZ, and Kofi Kingston says, our philosophy, the New Day, our philosophy is to lift your brother up. That is the goal. Kofi Kingston added, when we come out, we skip, we clap, I twerk. I think twerking is shaking your ass. I believe that's what twerk means. Okay? I, tw I twerk. I wear unicorn horns. We wear pink. I wore pink. That's not a bad thing. I wore pink. I wore it well. I wear blue. We throw pancakes out. We throw ice cream out. Bootios. Everything is not your typical style. This is Kofi Kingston. Okay. So for us to break up, God forbid, don't break up the new day. I know they do a lot of merchandise. I know, I know that kids buy, I know they're probably the number one merchandise. Anyway, God forbid you shoot at an old school angle and Big E or someone turns on you. To break up is the opposite of New Day. Just doing the standard there. It just won't happen. Everything we do, we do together. That is the mindset of your current WWE champion. And I just showed you where, how it's changed. My mindset is to shoot an angle and have the guy, your, your brothers, turn on you and beat the hell out of you. And then you have matches with them and you defend your championship and you've got a whole run there. But that's old school thinking. So I was just trying to help Kobe Kingston. And would you mind if I included my encounter with the Big E? Whatever you want, it's all yours. I'll wrap it up with this. About four years ago, before I even really was doing a lot of Facebook, Triple H called me and SmackDown was in Phoenix. Triple H and Stephanie were in LA doing some promotional stuff. Vince wasn't even there. It was Mark Carino, the head of talent, was running the place. Triple H called me and said, Superstar, I want you to come down to uh, SmackDown and do a couple hours of uh, interviews about the old days and uh, give you a good payoff. And I said, sure, that'd be great. So I, I went down and uh, did a, a couple hours and they actually asked me about Gordon George. I said, I don't know anything about Gordon George. <laughs> he was pretty good with the video I seen, but anyway, after the interview was over, two hours worth of interview, I went into the catering room and where all the guys were sitting around eating because uh, they provide food because you're there all day long for you folks who don't know. And so I go into the catering room and I sit down and I grab some uh, bananas and some stuff and some water. And Jerry Lawler is sitting down next to me. Mark Carino, the head of talent, uh, sitting next to me. And then in comes Booker T. And Booker T gives me a big hug and sits down and we start talking. And then uh, Seamus came over, the big, big uh, uh, Scottish, Irish guy with a mohawk, fantastic. I said, man, you're a great heel. 
that white skin, that pale look you got, you get heat from that being so pale. And he just gave me a big hug. Um, uh, the, the Mexican, uh, the big, big uh, El, El Patron. Oh, Alberto El Patron. Alberto El Patron. He came yeah. running over to me. said, oh, I want to meet you so bad. I said, man, I'm a big fan of yours. I'm a fan of yours, brother. You're a fan of me. And so I, a lot of guys were very, very, very nice to me. I sit down and I turn around. One table over, one table, six feet, from barely from me to you, Hannibal, six feet away, says the, says, uh, Big E. The Big E and Xavier Woods. Big E stood there like this. And I looked at the Big E. I said, I said, Big E, I said, Big E. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't, wouldn't look. Uh, and Mark Carino actually turned around and said, Big E, Superstar wants to tell you something. And so he still didn't look at me. I said, Big E, brother, your arms, that's what I said to the Big E. He said, six feet away from me. I said, your arms are the size of bowling balls, man. You got, man, you look fantastic. Fantastic. You got the best looking arms outside of Arnold Schwarzenegger I've ever seen, man. You look you look fantastic. What does the Big E say? Nothing. And what did he do? That was his response to me. Now I don't deserve to be bowed down to. But all he did was snub me. Big E, and I want to know one thing. I want to know one thing, and I'm going to close out with this. Without snub, are you a racist? Are you a racist against, I'm a white, I'm a white man. Are you, did you snub all white men? Are you a racist, Big E? Because you didn't even look at me. And I gave you a compliment. And all you did was snub me. So I want to know if you're a racist. And if you are, Vince, you need to do something about it. Because your company does not need racists. I'm not a racist. I love black brothers. Ernie Ladd, the big cat. I, I traveled with that man. I ate with that man. He was a mentor to me. I tag team with JYD, Junkyard Dog. I love Booker T. Butch Reed, you like? He got along with you too? Huh? Butch Reed as well? Butch Reed, I worked on an angle with Butch Reed and worked with him. Had great matches. Well, for me, it was great. But I love Butch Reed. SD Jones, back when he passed away. SD Jones, my black brother. I would ask SD Jones. If he needed a ride, a jobber, black jobber, I love S.D. Jones, love that man. So I am not a racist. I have black brothers that I love, but I'm questioning you. Are you a racist? Big E, end of interview. Oh. I have to catch my breath just a little bit. As I was saying, I had this a heart problem as well as the hip that I need replaced. And uh, they have to find out why the heart is not pumping the fluid back out of my feet and calves. They swell up, and the heart's not strong enough. They think the calves are closing. Uh, they haven't really, uh, I've got to go to a heart specialist here. Because I mean, we're in the, 
the new cancer center now. And I actually, I took my uh, hepatitis C medication regimen from this new cancer center. I have got a, a shortness of breath issue, as you can tell. And uh, this heart problem that I have to, that these veins closing off my calves, that has to be addressed as well as my hip replacement. And it's very complicated. It's, it's the newest type of hip replacement that they do. And uh, very complicated and a very high risk of dislocation after the hip replacement. It's called a hip revision at this point. And uh, so I've, I've been putting it all trying to raise money on my GoFundMe and um, very costly. And uh, how much is the hip surgery going to cost? The, the, the hip surgery, uh, the revision is $82,000. However, I do have Medicare, which is paying a substantial amount of that. But I also not only have the hip, uh, the balance of the hip uh, to pay out of pocket, but then whatever heart procedures they have to do. So I, I really need uh, help with my GoFundMe, so I'm making a plea now to not only wrestling fans, but to folks all over the world that if you could uh, donate something to my GoFundMe, it would be a tremendous uh, burden off of me to, to help pay this upcoming bill and, and an outstanding bill I have now. So, um, because you can't work, you're disabled and you're in your mid-70s, right? Oh, yes. I, I can't even go to wrestling uh, conventions that you and I have been at yeah. together uh, because I can't years. travel. Yeah. The longer I wait for the hip surgery, the worse it gets, the more complicated it gets. And thank God that in the orthopedic section of the, uh, this uh, Mayo Clinic, two, two, uh, two buildings down, uh, my doctor, Dr. Mark Spangel, is one of the best hip replacement surgeons in the world. I'm currently still under a, a Legends contract. It, it runs out in September, uh, a year from now, so you have a year and a half left. But they're doing nothing with my contract. My last royalty, I get a, every quarter you get a print out of your royalties. And my, the first quarter of this year, I just received a print out for the WWE and the total earnings of royalties facility dollars for me. So it shows you that really the WWE at this point is not interested in me. Right. I want to thank all of you that have already given also. There's a lot of folks that have already given. DDP even gave 500, Mark Mero gave 500. But That's right. Diamond Dallas Page uh, gave uh, 500. Uh, Mark Merrill generously gave 500, but some folks have only given 10 and 20. And that is just as important to me as the folks who are uh, able to give the 500. Right. Because it all adds up. So, so what's your goal? What's your actual financial goal to be able right to Right now, my, my goal is at 25,000. And I believe the latest count is a, a little over 6,000. So. I've got a ways to go, but I believe for the millions of people that are out there that will hear and see this, if somebody, if folks just give five dollars a piece, <laughs> you know, uh, what twenty thousand people yeah. do you have? I mean, you have five thousand Facebook friends, and I think about ten thousand followers at least on there. So even if yeah. all of them just gave five dollars, that would make a huge. That's difference. exactly right. I need help from the average, the average man out there, the man or woman, I'm making a plea for donations to my GoFundMe, which we'll put up a link.
yeah. and, and direct the fans right to my... It'll be right in the description of this video if people want to see the link to his GoFundMe.